be, be ta being taken on Etherpad. It's linked from the agenda. And there's an audio feed as well, which is the main vehicle for remote participants. And Meet Echo, too. Yes, I do. Unless you're willing to, you know, take over. No, I think we're good. You can help, because it's an Etherpad. You can help. Yeah? That'd be lovely. Okay, it's after two, so we should probably start. So good afternoon. Uh, this is HTTP, HTTP BIS. It's right after lunch, and I'm still jet lagged, so this should be interesting. Um, we have an hour and a half today, and then we have two hours on Friday. Um, so let's get right into it. So the blue sheets are going around. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this is the note well slide. Uh, these are the terms in which, under which you participate in the IETF, and hopefully everyone's familiar with this. If you're not, you can also search for IETF note well and find out more about this text. So the agenda we've got uh, is today we're going to have a brief discussion of a related meeting. Actually, it's not related meetings, it's just related meeting. Um, and then we're going to talk about the status of a couple specifications that we're finishing up, hopefully and then go on to the discussion of our active drafts. On Friday, um, the bulk of the time will be spent discussing RFC uh, 6265 BIS, which is, of course, the cookie spec. And we'll also talk about some related and perhaps future work that we might be taking on and, and have some discussion of that. Any agenda bashing? No? OK. So we have a Jabber scribe. Uh, it's a new Jabber scribe, so please be gentle. Charles, thank you very much. And and Chris Newman is being our, our, our actual scribe scribe, so thank you. Uh, you. Did you find the Etherpad? Great. So he's doing that in Etherpad. If people want to jump in and help him there or correct what has been said or, or whatever, that would be helpful too. It's at the top of the agenda. Sorry? Awesome. You're doing well as a Jabber scribe so far. Excellent. So. <clears throat> uh, is Jana here yet? Hmm. Well, that's a bit problematic. Sure. Please do. That would be most appropriate. Not with this gentleman sitting next to me. I'm not going to. Uh, so uh, the many of you will have attended the quick bar buff in Prague some time ago. This is a Quick actual BOF, um, I'm Ted Hardy speaking. Um, this is a working group performing BOF. The intent at this point is to take the formerly described monolith of Quick and break it into uh, appropriately sized building blocks uh, and associate those with work here in the ITF. So some of the things that you may have seen in previous drafts of Quick um, have been broken into individual drafts so that um, it's a uh, Reusing IETF technologies better and more reusable by IETF technologies better. Uh, it is a UDP. Oh, look, I'm channeling this guy. Come and stand next to me, and they can see the person I'm talking to. <laughs> We're at bullet point two. Shall we try and read aloud together? Sure. <laughs> a secure transport. You're doing that. A secure transport initially targeted at HTTPS. It will be Wednesday morning. From and 10 to 12.30. In Potsdam 1. In Potsdam. Now we're just echoing each other. This is the most harmony I've ever seen in Google standards participation. <laughs> so uh, if you have questions about it, you can grab John, you can grab me, or uh, okay. a cast of thousands. <laughs> yeah, and uh, as I've said in the past, people who know about this, uh, you know what you're coming in for. If you want to support us, please do show up. <laughs> uh, if you want to support this becoming a working group support, uh, uh, please come in. If you do not want to support this becoming a working group, go to one of the other sessions. <laughs> Good. So I think most people in the group are aware of that work, hopefully. I think it's important for us because, as he said, you know, one of the core targets is to, uh, for HTTPS. 
and we want to make sure that that's a graceful transition. If a new protocol, a new mapping of HTTP semantics to a wire protocol, we need to, as, as a community here, keep an eye on that. So moving on, uh, specification status. We have two specs that are nearing the end of, of, of our work on them, hopefully. One is the HTTP encryption content encoding. Uh, we, we had a working group last call on that that ended just a little while ago. And we had uh, some feedback on it in working group last call. I think, you know, with my chair hat on, I'm, I'm, I'd, I'd like to see a little more discussion of it. It seems like there's not yet been broad discussion, but the people who have reviewed it seem fairly happy. We did get some feedback uh, from Ecker more recently after the working group class call closed on list. And, and I think he wanted to open up some more discussion about that. And from my standpoint, I'm, I'm happy to sit on this and let that discussion take place before we go to the IETF last call. I'm happy for it to happen in IETF last call. So, uh, Ecker, did you want to kind of expound upon the concerns that you had? Sure. Let me see if I can do it by memory. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, when this was initially designed, it was designed to sort of, it was pitched as a simple mechanism that was without the, all the clutter. As background, the IETF has made a number of attempts over the years at designing secure messaging protocols of various kinds. Um, um, and those protocols typically come with some form of key exchange, key, key establishment, and they come with a, a framing layer for the data, and, um, and they come with an integrity check, and, um, so this was framed as being like, we're not gonna take out all that baggage of SMIME or Jose or whatever, and we're just gonna put it all in one, in one nice little package, only the thing we need. And over the, um, you know, as, as many standards do, over the, uh, uh, over, over, over the quite lifetime of the standards development, it is, is bloated. Um, and it's now picked up um, uh, a number of features which I'm not sure are really needed, um, and conversely has this extremely odd attitude that the only mm -hmm. symmetric algorithm supports is AESGCM while simultaneously supporting like, you know, b um, both uh, out of band authentication and, um, and integri integrity and confidentiality keys plus elliptic curve to be helmet plus finite field to be helmet. And that's an odd set of design choices. Thank you, but no. Um, Not gonna happen. That's an odd set of design choices. And so I think it'd be worth asking the question of what is the right set of design choices and what are the actual use cases? And <clears throat> should this be slimmed down or fattened up? Um, and yeah. if, if we really need something this fat, maybe we actually don't need a new thing at all, but rather should just steal with the old things that was already nice and fat. Yeah, so Martin Thompson, having read your email and had very little time to think about it. Um, there is a possibility here of maybe refactoring these sorts of things. The, the primary complex parts of this are only really used by the web push stuff. And it may be that we can sort of take those pieces out and sort of shove them over there and, and, and deal with that and keep this, um, the relatively slimmed down thing that it was originally, um, which I think might go a long way to addressing that. Uh, on your points on the DH stuff, yeah, that, that removes all of that as well because they have a very narrow profile. So, so Web Push has a very narrow profile as well um, that we could then just use directly and, and sort of get rid of all the baggage that you have around Diffie-Hellman groups and, and all those sorts of other things. So let's talk about doing that. I, I can have a, I can have a, a cut at that if, if, if necessary, but I need to think a little bit more about it, obviously. But I do want to say that to the best of my knowledge, there's nothing actually unsound about this document. I just am not sure that it's the right set collection of features. Right. Uh, you know, from my standpoint, I'd like to see some more review, and I'm trying to decide whether it's best to get that in, in the working group or in IETF last call. It sounds like we might benefit from bringing it back to the working group for one more round. I, I guess the well, only thing I'd say about this is it has now gotten to the point where it's not obvious to me that it is correct. Um, um, not that it's bad, but I'm just saying like the, there's enough pieces now involved that I'm not sure I could, I'm not I'm not sure how to demonstrate this correct without some more work than I've done, and, 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 and the original version I thought was like was relatively obviously correct, but um, hmm. maybe it wasn't, but it seemed obvious it was. Okay, so let's have uh, if, if this week and over the next couple of weeks, do you 
have time to, to iterate on that, work with Ecker, get a new draft out. Uh, we'll discuss it and, and probably go back to working group last call, do another WGLC. Is that going to cause issues for web push? I don't know what other people think about this, but um, my, my view is that people are doing web push and if I do this right, it won't actually change any of the bits on the wire for those guys. There's, okay. there's a large number of implementations of web push and that's one thing that we've got to be a bit sensitive to. And they are using this already? And they are using this already. Okay. All right, so I suppose working group stay tuned and, and when we get that next draft out, it would be great to get a few more eyeballs on it too. The other one is opportunistic security. Um, and I believe with that draft, we're just waiting for a revised internet draft before taking it to IETF last call. I think we've addressed all the issues that came up in last call uh, from memory. Um, Mike Bishop is the uh, shepherd for that doc. Is Mike in there? There he is. Is that, is that where you see us being at as well? Okay, Mike says yes. So uh, expect uh, maybe even this week uh, a new ID for that, which will then take to ITFLC, uh, and then hopefully get that, that doc done. So let's move on again. Um, the drafts that we currently have active are listed here. Uh, so let's start with RFC 5987 bis, which Julian tells me we do have some something to talk about. If I can get this to, let's see. Julian? Hello? Does this work? Hello? Hello? A little bit closer, maybe. Hello? But you're outside the pink box. Okay. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So this is about a way to put non-ASCII characters into parameter values in HTTP header fields that was invented a very long time ago for mail header fields um, that I profiled for use, for use in HTTP in uh, 2010 because it was already implemented in some browsers and after the work of um, writing down that standard in the end the browsers that hadn't implemented it it yet did so. So um, this is now widely deployed and interoperable. Um, next slide, please. Um, there are a few changes I made compared to the proposed standard, uh, proposed standard, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of which was in the original spec, um, we required support for both UTF-8 and ISO-8859-1 because that's what existing implementations actually did. Um, turned out that Microsoft, when they implemented that, chose to support only UTF-8 for very good reasons. and. Actually, one encoding that works is sufficient, so we are removing the ISO requirement from the spec. Um, the, all the normative references to ancient RFC specs are gone, so it's now based on the recent 1.1 specs. And um, when I wrote that spec in 2010, I was under the impression that I had to um, extend the existing ABNF for parameters in HTTP. It's six years later now and I realized that we actually never had a um, standard ABNF for parameters. So I have restructured the document, not trying to um, redefine something that doesn't really exist. So some of which, some of the stuff that used to be in ABNF now is in prose. Next slide. So I think I have done all the changes I wanted to do. Um, some of the changes I did last 
Friday eight days ago in, in the evening. So I probably introduced some breakage and I need to review what I submitted on that evening. And uh, once I've done that, I think we are ready technically for working group last call. That being said, um, this spec also changed to an experiment in spring where we actually introduced uh, non-ASCII characters into examples to test the submission path uh, in the IETF data tracker and um, we uh, <laughs> we um, uh, arranged that the IESG back then and the uh, RFC editor were okay with that. So this now works for this draft, but it's not totally clear whether we can leave things as they are if we want to go to, uh, if we want to submit that for publication, we'll need to find out this week, I guess. Otherwise we'll have to back out these changes. Next slide, Bun. okay. <clears throat> so any discussion of that draft? Any questions for Julian? Okay. I, I know that this is probably one of the lower level drafts that, that a lot of people might not take a deep look at. Um, for me, I, we were having discussion over lunch about this a bit about, you know, can we use UTF-8 in, in headers? And I'm, I'm starting to think that one thing that we might want to add to this draft is, and this is personally, um, is is a, an explanation of why you would want to use this encoding and not use, for example, UTF-8 if you're defining a new header. Um, because there is so much software, in, in, and this comes up in a number of places in HTTP where on the wire, maybe from the client to the server, you can count on you know having a clean encoding, but once you jump through all the different hoops of the different pieces of software that's going to touch a header, you can't make assumptions about encoding, and you can't say, you know, put it in UTF-8 and know that all the frameworks and, and, and the client-side APIs are going to handle that properly. And so there may actually be a place for this encoding even going forward. So that would be <coughs> more pros on the motivation. I, uh, I'm starting to think that way. So I might try and write up a, a pull request and, and see if people agree with that or not, or at least have the discussion. And this kind of touches on the discussion of JFV as well, but we'll, we'll get there. Which might have that part of, about the motivation. So we might just move things over. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so our next draft, if I can find this again, is key. Uh, in Buenos Aires, we talked about parking this spec. I still see a decent amount of interest in the capability that's provided by this spec. What I don't see is as much interest in implementation. There have been people who have said they've started an implementation uh, but we haven't yet any, seen any interop or any full implementation in a cache. And uh, I'm uncomfortable pushing this spec forward until we get some implementation experiment uh, experience, mostly because we kind of have one shot at it. You know, if, if you want to change the format of how it works or change the vocabulary that, that you have for, for talking about request headers, you'd have to introduce a new key-like header, and that gets pretty unscalable pretty quickly. So um, if, we, if anybody wants to talk about key, we can do that now, but, but for now it's, it's parked until we get more implementer experience or, or interest. And, and I guess the follow-on question, Alexi, are you comfortable with having a document parked like that for that purpose? We do have other things to do, yes, it's true. Okay. Anything? Understood. Alexi says we're okay so far. Okay. Next up is the client hints draft. Uh, and Ilya is not here. Ilya Gregoric from Google is uh, the editor on that one. Um, this is work that, as I understand it, we're pretty much ready to go to working group last call on, on our side. But there's a corresponding integration of what to do how, how to, to, to handle uh, uh, client hint generation in the browser that's happening in the fetch specification in the what working group. And so we're waiting for that 
to be completed and, and to be solidified before we actually ship this spec. So for now, it's on hold. If people want to start reviewing it, that's fine. I'm actually fine doing an extended working group last call on it if we want to, just to make sure that it does get an appropriate level of review. But I think that our work is pretty much done. Julian? Julian um, Reschke. In relation to key and client hints, I think client hints currently sort of relies on key being there. So um, if we decide to let key sitting there, we'll have to change the client hints back to at least change the reference to be informative. Yeah, and, and, and I think you opened an issue about that, and we discussed it a little bit. Um, the, my personal feeling is that it is effectively an informative reference. You don't need to use key to use client hints. It just makes it much more efficient. Um, and saying that, I'm, I'm not actually going and looking at the issues lists for these, which maybe we should do just to make sure that we're not missing any discussions. So yeah, there were a few things open more recently. You opened uh, an editorial issue. The quoted string handling for param directive, what was that? Yes. Back to key for a moment. Oh, right, that was just about the, uh, we, we parked this until we got more experience with it, that's right. And that's a future feature, and that's these are all things that we felt we could sit on until we knew that we were actually going to move forward with the spec. Okay, good. And for client hints, yeah, so you opened the normative reference to key spec. I think that can be flipped into informative. Does that make sense to you? So to channel Julian, he thinks it depends uh, on the specific text and also does require some other changes as well. Okay, so let's talk that through. Um, and this issue here, I believe we said that is really just a placeholder for discussion in the what working group. Yeah, and with the HTML spec actually as well. Oh, sorry. Ah. That one. So that is issue 156. But the last I talked to Ilya, he thought we could probably go ahead and move this forward as long as we were happy with the, the state of what's in the wet working group and in, in the HTML spec. Next, sorry, did you have describing? Yeah, you have a Jabba comment uh, from Fielding. For hints, not sure that security considerations are adequate. Okay, can he file an issue? I, client hints reveal a lot more tra tracking info than noted by the spec, because many, many sites don't allow embedded JavaScript in subframes. So effectively, that's expanding the capabilities that those sites would have, or, or the information provided to them. That's an interesting discussion to have, yeah. Roy, could you please open an issue for that so we don't forget it? Let's see what kind of lag we have today. I'll assume he will. Thanks. Uh, the fourth spec is the origin frame. You know what? Let's make this easier. Where does everything go? There it is. So right now we have two issues open on this. Uh, the first one is 178, opened by Martin. 
if an origin frame has a wild card certificate, the origin frame allows it to narrow scope. But if we accept 177, which was, which one was that? That was a pull request, wasn't it? Ah, uh, oh, that's the other issue, right? Supporting the delta, so allowing you to do a delta over time, not just do a single shot. Um, there's a potential for the origin to lose any claim to wild cards without enumerating the entire space at a high cost and with a privacy risk. One way to avoid that would be to support the use of a wild card, and the rules in RFC 2018 are probably appropriate. Yep. And we had a little side discussion about strange, evil things to do, but that, that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Yeah, I have another question. I didn't have time to support Um I didn't have time to file an issue, but uh, is it specified anywhere, like how origin frames interact with Alt SVC, for example? Like, what is the origin specified when you do an Alt SVC somewhere? And like, it seems like we should use the original origin as still the rules for origin frames. Hmm. Could you open an issue for that? Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Ben Schwartz from Jigsaw. And you know, I've I've spoken with some HTTP experts who who say that you really should never trust uh, content termination if you have uh, multiple res uh, responses in a stream that uh, that you you shouldn't really trust the distinction between them. Essentially, uh, you shouldn't concatenate responses from independent trust uh, anchors. And so I'm wondering how that applies here. If uh, so, if I don't see anything in the security section indicating whether this is considered to be appropriate for use with a combination of uh, origins that that are not mutually trusting. So um, the, the context here is that this is um, a facility to help uh, with the HTTP2 connection pooling. The advice that you were talking about is, is, in my experience, that's usually brought up for HTTP 1. Um, and this is not an HTTP 1 mechanism. This is, uh, HTTP 2 already allows connection pooling where you can have multiple origins on a, on a single connection under certain circumstances. And this is about uh, uh, more carefully allowing the server to specify which of, of the origins that a certificate or covers to be used on that connection. Uh, right, well, so I would appreciate a little more or clear guidance uh, on whether this is appropriate to use with a combination of origins on a single connection where those origins don't have a trust relationship. I, I think the guidance you're looking for probably is in HTTP2 itself because because that the capability is defined in HTTP2. And I'm happy to show you and we can talk through that. I, I don't doubt that more guidance would be good, but but it's probably not for this spec, I think. Yeah. Is that on? Take two. Okay. That's better. Uh, Mike Bishop, I think the other comment there is that with vanilla HTTP2 connection coalescing, all the origins you deal with are in the same cert. So there's likely more of a trust relationship there. Now, mm -hmm. if we go down the route of supporting multiple certs, which we're going to talk about Friday, that's when things start to get interesting about do those multiple origins and multiple certs have a trust relationship or do they just happen to be on the same server? Sure. So, Martin Thompson, just staring at what's on the screen here, you were talking about flags. Hmm. And it turns out that we actually have now a pattern that's evolving where we're using these flags to, say, to, to sort of build up an image of what a set of things is, yes. and we have the positive, and we have the negative, and we have this is at least two specs right things, now. and we yeah. have the the we'd like to reset everything. Um, I'd like to see us actually work on a, a coherent pattern. How about an HTTP two sets frame? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that some best practices at the very least would be a nice thing to have here, so we don't reinvent the That's wheel every time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and since Mike brought up the, um, we, we, we will talk on Friday about the server certificates thing. From what I've seen so far, there's fairly strong interest in having a facility to, to add new certificates to a connection somehow. And the question that, that's in the back of my mind now is should we 
maybe hold this spec specification back a little bit until we know more about that, because it seems like there's a level of coordination that might need to happen there. So, so if people have thoughts about that, I'd like to hear them. So I actually filed issue 212 and forgot to tag it origin when I did it, so it didn't come up in your search. Oh, okay, I can, I can fix that for you. Uh, consider it fixed. Oh, Martin, you beat me to it. So um, I, I think the outcome on this particular issue is what Martin was just saying, which is let's figure out some generic patterns for how to handle working with sets of metadata in, in, in H2E2 frames and, and then apply that here. Um, regarding your issue, where did it get to? 212. So that's along similar lines, isn't it? Which is, you're adding requirements to that, good. So really these three issues are all of the same kind of ilk in that sense. Um, so, so what I just spoke about, about uh, uh, holding off on this spec a little bit, not, not stopping discussion, but not pushing forward a working group last call quite yet. Are people happy to wait around a little bit longer on it? I see nodding heads. I don't see any shaking heads. My co-author is nodding his head, which is good. Okay. Next up is, is perhaps a little more of a substantial discussion, especially given the recent activity on the mailing list, uh, the JFV spec. So do you want to do an overview of that first, Julian? So I used to have slides that I brought to many previous meetings explaining all the problems related to <coughs> header field value syntax, and I am not repeating them now. So um, rather than that, I'd like to summarize what's been discussed on the mailing list lately. So, so not yet, apparently. Um, I started that as a thought experiment two years ago because um, people were confused about how to define syntax for new header fields and we've been wondering what if we had a standard grammar for that and I played around with, with the idea how it would look like if JSON would be the format for that, although I really dislike JSON, but I tried that. So um, I've been working on that draft uh, in my spare time over the last two years and then in spring we adopted that as a working group draft with the underlying assumption that this is work in progress and we might end up with something completely <coughs> else. Next slide. Um, <coughs> so uh, the draft shows that we could use JSON, but there are quite a few open issues and problems with that. So one of which being that it really creates the, a very chatty syntax on the wire. Um, another issue that we have that would be um, an issue for any other new format that we choose is that in HTTP we have the uh, possibility that a header field repeats within a message and we can't change that at least not in HTTP 1.1 or 2 and the question is is it the best way to define header fields in a way so that they can actually work with multiple values or should we encourage people to reject messages where a field value repeats and concentrate on, on a syntax that does not allow list notation. Um, another open issue, is this something that we just define for, that we just provide for people defining new header fields? Or do we actually try to retrofit existing header fields definitions to the syntax? And if we do, how do we deploy that? Um, looking at JSON, um, independently of the actual JSON 
syntax on the wire, there are JSON data model constraints that don't make us very happy, like the fact that it, although it allows members to repeat in the message format, the parsers don't actually tell you what happens. So we have a potential interop problem here. Yeah. There's also um, some ambiguity or not, uh, what the, the way numbers are transported in JSON make the use of JSON numbers a potentially bad idea to use as a um, protocol element because JSON would allow float notation and um, some kind of imprecision and so on. Um, and then finally, is this just something that we want to use on the wire for HTTP 1.1 and 2, or is this something that would solve all the header field value problems in future HTTP specs? So is this something we want to do in the short term, mid term, or is that for the long term? So, so Martin discuss. Thompson, I, th I think um, that, that was a good summary of the discussion that we've had. Yeah. And I think to a large extent, the discussion that we've been having has sort of been hedging around the core problem, which is um, how much of this is a schema aware language that we're defining, given that HTTP 1.1 header fields are essentially, I mean, you have to know what the header field means before you can parse it. So it's essentially schema aware, but then each one of them has this informal, well, a lot of them have this informal schema free component to the, to the definition of them where they have parameters or some other way of extending them. Um, so how much, how much of this is a schema free thing versus a, a fully schema defined um, syntax? And that sort of goes to the decision that we, that you sort of went with Jason, is people actually understand where the, the boundaries are in JSON with respect to extending and, and how things uh, define themselves um, and where not to go, um, such as if this thing is defined as an integer, I can't just blob an, an object there and expect people to, to be happy, so I just don't do that. Hmm. Um, even though it's possible in JSON, people don't do those sorts of things. So I, I'd like us to sort of maybe step back a little bit at this point. Um, I know that um, uh, PHK's talked about using Seabor in this context, and I think that that sort of really, for me, cemented the 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 problem, which is we don't actually understand what it is that we want out of yeah. this process. We don't understand where um, we need the sort of schema-free constructs versus the very tightly defined definitions, and obviously there's benefits on both ends of that scale. Obviously, if we if we can manage to pack um, dates into the most efficient representation imaginable, we had a big discussion about this during the development of HPAC, you can get down to five bytes for pretty much every single date that's mm -hmm. ever on the wire versus the 13, 14, 18, I can't remember exactly what the number is now. And there's some real efficiency gains there, not just in terms of saving bytes, but all sorts of other um, processing gains. So um, we need to walk that space, I think, a little more carefully. I'd like to encourage us not to commit to the fact that this says Jason in the title um, to Jason. I think the discussion has revealed to me that Jason is probably a bad idea um, for this. So we need to be a little bit more open. And perhaps this is something that we, where we use something that exists or we go off and yeah, yeah. Take the ball by the horns. Invent. Yeah. Yeah. Eric Nygren, another area that's directly related to this, where I think this has the possibility to either make things better or much worse, depending upon some of these items, is the class of recent vulnerabilities around how different servers um, in a past sure. introduce different header fields, whether they're repeating, line wrapped. So some of these things around how do you deal with repeated values, if we're not really clear about that, or if we don't make, or if we pick things in slightly the wrong direction, we could make things a lot worse there, or if we are much more clear about some of this, and I think this goes to Martin's comments on like how, trying to figure out what are we trying to solve, could actually make things much better if we could be much more clear about when things are and start being ambiguous, these are cases where you must start rejecting. And, um, 
to avoid some of those issues. Mm -hmm. So, so when we talked about adopting this, um, we were pretty clear that, as as Julian said, that it might not look much like what it went into the process as. And from the recent discussion on on the list, it's become pretty clear there's a a, a lot more skepticism about using JSON than there was even a week ago. Um, so I'd I'd really like to see that discussion continue. I, I'm happy to keep this document adopted as a placeholder for an indicator of the interest in the working group in this topic. Um, and, and again, when we adopt the document, the primary interest that, that I heard was, you know, specifying new HTTP headers is really hard, and effectively Julian is a bottleneck in doing so. You know, if you want good review, you have to take it to Julian. Uh, we're now having other requirements being put upon what this work might be, and that might be a good thing, but I think Martin's absolutely right. Let's, let's pick through them carefully and understand what we're doing and why we're doing and what the implications may be before we jump down a path too quickly. Yeah, and, and the other thing to, to note here is that there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm for fixing a lot of the problems that, that are apparent in the existing header fields. We need to develop a story for how this gets deployed. Yes. And that has its own challenges. Do Indeed. we put in, you know, do we have a date header and also a date star header? Hmm. Sure that has this new encoding and what if they disagree and all this of other things, um, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you do backward compatibility? And, and that is a separable problem to a degree. I can imagine to approaches yes. to that even in HTTP2 we could, we could work something yeah, out. So in HTTP2 we have settings and we could exactly. negotiate it, but how do you incrementally deploy changes or do you have to change them all in one tranche? And, uh, yeah. You know, one, one approach that, that I've thought about is you define a set of alternate headers for the standard headers with different names. You say this has the same semantics but a different serialization and this is the precedence and error handling. And, yeah. But then you have to negotiate its use. Yeah. So I think there needs to be a lot more discussion around that and it seems like the discussion on the list is becoming healthy, which is good. Um, hopefully we'll see some more drafts where people can flesh out some of these ideas. But I expect we're going to be talking about this one for a little while, I think. We're yeah, we're just starting. So here's a question. Should we try to come to a agreement what actually the goals are? I mean, people, everybody has their own set of goals for this, mm -hmm. at least from those involved in the discussion. And I think it's pretty clear that a single, uh, that we are probably not be able to address all these goals in with one format, mm -hmm. or at least not within like, like 24 months. So I think we should have a meta discussion about what, what is this supposed, how is this supposed to help? What is the target? Mm -hmm. Because that will influence what we can do. I mean, Discussing how header fields could be represented in HTTP 3 is an important and interesting discussion, but um, I don't think that should delay any help for people doing things with HTTP 1.1 and 2. Yeah. So from the Jabber, how, how close are we to reinventing ASN 1 or Turtle? Who, who is or, that from? Uh, <laughs> was, it, was it Roy? Oh. Okay. <laughs> I think I think capturing uh, potential goals is is a very useful thing to do right now. Uh, maybe we just need to spool up a wiki page and and start writing down and collecting some of the discussion there. Any other thoughts about JFV? Okay. Was that a decision to spin up a web page? I'll, I, I will start a wiki page, yes. Okay. <laughs> We're not that formal around here. Last but not least for today, and I see we're doing very well with time, uh, we have the Cache Digest specification, which um, we recently adopted. And the internet's are very slow all of a sudden. There we go. 
And so we don't have any open issues on it, but there has been some discussion. Um, I think Martin raised some, some issues around how complex the document has become since we had draft zero zero, which I think is, is fair feedback. Um, as an author on that, so, so this is one of the documents where I'm an author, so we have a, a separate uh, document shepherd, that's Natasha Rooney here in the front row. Wave, Natasha. Okay. Um, personally, you know, one of the reasons we did that was because it was hard to anticipate all the use cases for Cache Digest. And you can imagine a number of different patterns that both sites and browsers might want to use them in. And so we went a little bit shotgun on it to see if we could capture those. Um, I am more than happy to have a discussion about what the high order use cases are and, and, and paring it back down if that's an appropriate thing to do. Does that make sense to you, Martin? Just Martin Thompson, just trying to refresh state on that. On yeah, that. it's good um, like that. So there is a, com a piece of complexity that I suggested be added, and that was the URI normalization or something, <laughs> at least some hand wavy stuff that. So I, wrong, yeah, we, did, we actually didn't, I meant to respond to that and I didn't. Um, so we don't really have URI no normalization for the cache. So why would we have it for digest of the cache? Exactly. Um, part of the problem here is I don't know what people do to the octets that get put on the wire. I'm a little, little worried that we're going to lose some. Lose some efficiency. Yeah. Um, and it is only an, efficiently, an efficiency loss, but it's probably best to have some some <coughs> recommendations that people follow. Um, a, a conservative maybe. normalization, Just perhaps. Very conservative, yeah. and it's not going to be guaranteed to produce. It's not a canonicalization in the sense right. that you're going to produce exactly the same. Lowercase the scheme, lowercase the host, remove the port if it's a default port, that kind of stuff. Basically, all the stuff that is actually in the HTTP 1.1 spec, sure. um, with maybe a few extra things sure. to, to sort of make it a bit easier. I did some of that exercise myself recently. Um, and yeah, just nail down the whole, um, I have this stale, I have this fresh, and how you manage those sets of information and, right. and the model that's associated with that, because I found that quite unclear. In the yeah, I think we could do a much better job editorial, and, and that's my fault of, uh, yeah. of explaining that, and maybe we need to go to the use cases. Um, the, it, it seems like there's some sort of mismatch between the flags that you use to manage the I think there's four different sets of information that you can potentially send out, mm -hmm. and the reset and the complete thing, and it's mm -hmm. all a little bit hazy. Would you want to do a partial reset? See, so th these are the sorts of things that you need need to address. But yeah. um, what happens when you put a reset on a on a frame that has content in it, and what happens when you put a reset on a frame that has right. a particular type of content in it? Right. You know, you've just marked something as being stale, and it's got e tags, and it's also got a reset on it. Right. The, the intent is, and it's I agree, not clearly laid out. But the intent is, is when you receive a frame like that, you process the reset, so you clear your state, then you process the content. Because right. doing anything else doesn't make any sense. Exactly, yeah. and that's the logical thing, but none of that's sure. True. Sure. So, um, I, I think this is this is like really good stuff. Uh, I think there's an, another piece of feedback that I need to provide around um, uh, the probability stuff that I, you know, 4 a.m. this morning was thinking about, um, but. I think this is this is probably something I'd like to see go out as experimental rather than proposed standard and relatively soon. Um, because I think once we sort through all of those minor issues, I don't, don't mm. actually see, it's just not that much, that much to it. It's, no. There's not that many moving parts here and, and we don't get any value out of this until people start playing with it. Right. And I'd like to get to that point sooner what, rather than later. What I'd like to understand is, is that at least initially, you know, as a browser cache, you know, owner, what kind of frames would you want to send out? Would you send out both fresh and stale? Would you want to send a complete set, or would you want to clamp it down to a certain size? There are a lot of open questions there, especially on the browser side, but also on the consumer side, of course, of what they find most valuable. But to me, that's more intuitive. I know, kind of know what I want to see, you know. Yeah, we're, we're intuiting everything at the moment. That's the problem. And that, yeah. that's a real that's problem. Why that's like why I want to see this as a, an experimental document that's published you know, in in six months time rather than in three years time when it, when we all agree that it's perfect because we're not going to work this out until people actually try to start using it. I know that Stefan's done some implementation work on the server side, mm -hmm. which is great. But without a browser. Some experiments, but we, 
I'd like to see this in the browser and I'd like to see some real telemetry that, that comes so, out of that. From a process standpoint, I mean, we could publish, you know, what we call for H2 an implementation draft and say, we're using this to gather feedback and burn one of the experimental frame IDs rather than giving it a real frame ID. I don't know how you feel about that. I, I think I'd be, be happier just pushing it through the process. I just experimental and burn a frame it, ID? Yeah, this, this, it's not that complex. How many do we have? I forget. Um, there's not many frame IDs. Yeah, that's why I was like. I think it's 16. How many bits the, is it? In the private use range or something. It's it's, it's eight. It's an eight bit. Thing. It's an eight. Okay. We have to be careful with these things. That's why I'm a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we may not be able to do experimental now that I think about it. Because there are only 16. No, because oh well. Oh, you mean process wise. Process wise. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because the registry policy. So, you know, so uh, one of the patterns that I started with a different draft, but I didn't carry on into this, was I burned uh, an experimental um, frame ID, but I put magic at the beginning of the frame payload to disambiguate it from other experimental uses, and that's something we could do. Because that would give us something, you know, three, four bits, whatever. No, experimental. Did you look at the registry policy? Or IESG approval, Mike Bishop. Anybody else have a preference on which path to take there? I mean, you know, if we only have 256 of these things, it's still potentially burning one. Of course, we still have status codes left over, so, you know. Okay. Um, I'll have a side discussion with you and we'll work on some of the use cases. Is anyone intending to implement this on the client side or on a cache side? Uh, uh, actually, I have a service worker based implementation using headers. Yeah. So uh, that could be done by others as well and it can be used immediately. Mm -hmm. Cool. And, and yeah, if, if folks don't know, Kazoo is the other author on this draft. Okay. Um, I know that on the list and in, in some back channel, I, I also got interest in people using this for um, non-browser to server cache digest communication, so cache to cache. Uh, for folks who remember, Squid has cache digest and has had it for probably two decades or so where it uses uh, for intercache communication. I'm not sure we should explicitly target that use case, but we shouldn't explicitly disable it either, I guess. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Right, uh, were, were any client side, do you remember? Okay, all server side, okay. I think, you know, there's a lot of server side interest in this because of the, the, the potential benefits, so. Okay. Anything else about Cache Digest? Kazuho, did you want to say anything more? No. no? Good for now? Okay. All right. Well, um, we have a half an hour left, but I think it's it's probably a natural stopping point now. On, on Friday, we have two hours, and we have a fairly substantial discussion of the cookie spec, and then uh, a few different proposals that have been in flight for a little while. And I think we do have enough time of it uh, for, for all of that. Charles, you wanted to talk about SDCH. You're ready to. Do, you're not ready to do that now. Okay. Patrick, cache control immutable. Are you prepared to say a few things about that yet, or you don't wait till Friday? I don't need slides. I know that you can. You can win a crowd. If you want to wait till Friday, that's fine. I'm just wondering if we can use this time now. Okay, that's fine. Um, and Gabriel, I'm guessing you're not ready for the Internet of Things discussion quite yet, are you? Friday? Okay. We're a working group who likes to get our slides in early, and that's a good thing. 
Okay. Well, let's uh, let's break early then and give give everybody some time back. Sorry. Ah, yes. I got conflicting messages about whether that was something we would actually talk about. Are we going to talk about that here? I got conflicting messages about whether people want to. I would have done it at the beginning, but someone told me not to. So, okay, please do. Okay, <coughs> so we're <coughs> tomorrow morning, eight thirty in the morning. In <laughs> yes, in the morning, in the room over there, Charlotte and uh, one. We're gonna have a meeting, talking about blind cash, the different uses, it's, it's and of the cure content delegation. So, mm -hmm. you're all welcome who's with interest of this topic. Um, please prepare. At least to take some look at drafts being been announced on the mailing list, etc. And it's available. So, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, so we've talked about blind caching on and off. Charlottenburg one, I think. Yeah. yeah. We've talked about this a few times. So this is a, a, an informal event to continue that discussion. You'll go. You're gonna. You're gonna give it a go. Uh, I can put on like the iTunes visualizer behind you if you want or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you check out my slides, I'm going to talk about a new cache control extension um, that we will. If it, um, we are currently deploying a version of this for Firefox after this being brought forward uh, by our friends at, at Facebook. And it's a cache control extension called Immutable. Um, and it has basically the property of, you can ask me if this resource has changed an infinite number of times for an infinite length into the future, and the answer will be 304. Um, and that's the semantic of the extension. So typically you would combine this with uh, a really, really large max age, which is what you see people doing today. So this goes to a design pattern you typically see on the web, where resources, particularly sub-resources, images, JavaScript, that kind of thing, never change. When they do change, they just get renamed, and the references to them use the new names, right? So um, Facebook made a public post on this topic, and they said some phenomenal amount of their traffic, and this is because I have not read my own blog post uh, to prepare for my slides, which don't exist, uh, maybe 20% of their traffic was essentially uh, 304s for resources that had not been a, around, that had not been alive as long as the max age they were published with, right? So they publish a max age of a year, and people, you know, four minutes after this resource came into existence are saying, hey, have you changed yet? And at first we were all like looking around at our cache code, like why are we not trusting our cache code? 20%, um, yeah, it's a huge number. Um, and a huge number of round trips from you know the latency sensitive client point of view and a huge amount of load on the server to look this up and to generate a 304. Um, so if you look at somebody's uh, wall page um, on a lot of social media sites and you're like, I don't know, maybe you're looking at a relationship status and it says, you know, single, reload, single, reload, single, reload, in a relationship, yes. Right, um, you know, a thousand HTTP transactions happened on those five reloads um, when what you were really interested in getting was the update on the markup. So um, that's like what's behind this. Um, so just for fun, uh, we sort of ran a mock-up with Facebook and it performed extraordinarily well, taking what you would expect, the 200 resources on that page, click and reload, turning it into um, three or four transactions, right? Uh, really nice stuff. Um, I published this on my blog. I started getting a bunch of tweets, five or six like other very small little websites uh, started publishing this because it was a really easy little attribute to, just to do. Um, and that seems to be working out well. So this is currently, I believe, in the Firefox beta channel. Um, the reason I wasn't going to bring it forward as, um, as an internet draft at this meeting was we haven't put it under, out onto release yet and run the official experiment uh, to see what the numbers look like. But that is the intention. And maybe in Seoul or something, we'll bring a draft uh, forward to make that happen. Uh, the most interesting thing people want to usually talk about is its interaction with MaxAge, and so we should clearly talk about that. Um, the way I have it defined, the semantics are, um, you know, currently will always return 304, so don't bother asking. So I do honor MaxAge in case you're doing hit counters or something like that, but what happens at the end of MaxAge is a non-conditional request is done for the object. So 
if you'll never give me a 304, I don't ever send if modified since. And that was the semantics of you putting a mutable on it. We can talk about that, but that's a regular topic of, of interest, and that's about the only one that comes up in, in how does this work. So, so but, but, but explicitly, you, you modify the semantics of reload so that it doesn't emit a request. That's the big change. I, yeah, I couldn't hear you right oh. here. I, I could not hear you, which is really weird. <laughs> um, the, the change, the, the biggest change in semantics is that for when, when this is present, the reload semantics change. So you don't issue a request up on a reload. That's correct. I okay. use it as a, you get an automatic cache it without a validation. Okay. Uh, Brian Paul, Yahoo. We also see about 20, 20% of 304s <coughs> on the servers. Um, why aren't browsers actually taking the max age into account more often and not actually going and asking for the resource again? You mean without without the presence of immutable? Yes. Um, so we interpret max age as essentially a lease period for which you can reuse the response, but it does not make a guarantee about the content of the entity on the origin server. So we interpret someone as pressing reload as looking for an update of the data on that page. Huh. Is the stock quote different? Yeah, yeah. I kind of figured that was the case, but yeah. It, and it's 20% of our traffic. So right, well, immutable allows you to disambiguate that. And, it, and it's, um, I've talked to other large companies and they, they're also seeing around 20% of their traffic is also three or fours. Yeah. So, I mean, that is the other thing that's been brought up. Is so like, well, if the max age is big enough, why don't you just like, you know, imply immutable? And that makes me kind of nervous. Sure. <laughs> because your content is immutable. <laughs> I'm worried about all that other content. Julian Reschke, while we are, have you up there and we are talking about reloads, um, could you say two or one or two sentences about the difference what browsers do upon F5 and Control F5? Is there still a difference? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So Control F5 has always meant, or Shift F5, it depends. There's a hard reload semantic depending on where you are and what browser you're in. But the, the normal reload sends off a bunch of 304s on a page, and the Shift reload um, ignores the cache and loads everything from scratch. And that's still, even in the presence of immutable, is what happens. Okay. 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 Uh, Roy Fielding. You uh, are not Roy Fielding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, immutable, immutable should just override older things like max age, since that allows non-deploying clients to interpret max age as normal. This is the design of cache control. Yeah. And while he's at it, Mark, Please add more information in tools.ietf to point contributors to the GitHub page for issues and put some instructions on how to uh, assign issues to specific drafts. Okay. So it's very hard to put information in tools.ietf without involving the tools team. So, so the other thing I was going to touch on, um, I'm standing here. While we're still on that one, d have you done anything? Does it affect your cache eviction algorithm at all? Yeah, what? Immutable. Does it what? Affect your cache eviction algorithm. Cache eviction algorithm, no. Okay. But it's an interesting question now that you mention it. Okay. But it does not. Okay. Um, which means if you deployed it without max age, you would get a heuristic number, and I don't think that's an awesome You idea. don't want to deploy without max age, but yeah. Um, yeah. So I was going to mention, um, because we, we sort of concocted it in the same experiment, um, we have deployed, and more recently Chrome has deployed, um, Broly as a content encoding um, option for the web, widely done. Um, it's been really successful um, in terms of um, efficiency, so you should look into it, from, especially from the client side. The client side, it's very similar in time and space to gzip, very, very similar. It's harder on the server side, so if you're pre-computing, it's kind of a no-win, and if you're not pre-computing, it's or a no-brainer, rather, not a no-win. Uh, if you're not pre-computing, it's a, it's a harder decision. Um, what I wanted to bring up here, though, um, was purely from an interop point of view, we've done it over HTTPS only, and that has largely been successful um, in terms of just learning what we're, oh, look at that, um, in terms of learning what we're able to deploy. Um, there was one problem with one piece of antivirus software, which its failure mode, um, it passed through accept encoding of Broly just fine, and when it got something that content encoded and it did not understand it, it decided that was actually okay, and it gave the client the direct byte streams of the message body, but it stripped the content encoding header. <laughs> um, yeah, and that didn't go so hot. 
So, uh, but that was bug fixed and out there, and that was only the only big problem. So it's looking like at least in HTTPS con context, uh, more of these encodings negotiated in the usual way, no sniffing or anything like that, is looking more plausible. So I'll do. I use it on my website. Um, I might have missed the book. Texas, all Yeah, yeah, no, it's only in HTTPS. The West, yeah, is there another web? Uh, antivirus. Antivirus, yes. So, uh, follow, so, um, so I was following up on this, uh, but with the mutable, would it also make sense to deploy only with HTTPS? Because uh, you add an additional risk where, like, somebody, some man in the middle adds an immutable property and forever <coughs> crashes in the browser. So we only do it over HTTPS. <laughs> the, um, Martin Thompson, the other thing that you also do is you only do it for strongly framed stuff, which is if, if the connection closes and to mark the end of the request, that's right. not good enough. Right. HTTP2 or something with a content length that actually matches up right. with the length of the bytes that you get. Um, yeah. there's, a, there's a bunch of icky stuff around what you've got to do. We were talking about this in the mailing list the other day yeah. of, of how much this happens out there in the space that you get yeah. responses that have framing that doesn't make any sense. And you're right, we don't trust immutable under those circumstances. Yes. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Patrick. You did. It's awesome. OK, um, so we don't have quite as much extra time left anymore. Uh, does anybody have anything else they'd like to bring up? We can do any other business today, and then Friday's left for the rest of the agenda. The issues list for OPSEC. I may have, yes. Apologize, I'm working under heavier jet lag than usual. Uh, where did it go? There it is. I think this one's done, Mike, isn't it? I think we just forgot to close it. Let's check. Yeah. Yeah. Why isn't this closed? Um, oh. Yeah, we, had a whole bunch of back and forth, but we did come to a state where we were happy with it? Yeah, yeah OK. So we can close this? Mike is happy to close this. Cool. OK. That's all we've got for today. Uh, see everyone on Friday. And don't forget the quick buff. Oh, did you have something? Sorry. Chicago Cable Labs. I wasn't going to bring this up on the working group, or but since there is time, I thought I'll just ask. So this was a email that was that we sent out a while ago about the byte, the range request, and the bytes issue. Yes. And there was quite some interesting discussion that happened, and I, I was trying to just kind of get a gist of what the final suggestion or recommendation was. I think that would be helpful. Sure. So that is. Where did we put that? So there was a discussion of, <clears throat> as I understand it, you need a slight tweak, tweak to the semantics of, of, of the bytes range unit. And the question was, can we modify the semantics in place for bytes, or is a new range unit required? Uh, and this draft was proposing the latter approach, which is a new range unit. And there was a discussion, as I recall, um, I think Roy was advocating reusing uh, or changing the semantics of bytes if we got data, and, and I, I don't mean to put words in his mouth, I'm sure he'll correct me, uh, if we get appropriate data that's reasonably safe with implementations, and I don't think we have that data yet. Um, because there's a risk to uh, introducing a new range unit as well. Not only in terms of, you know, it will break or, or it won't give you the benefit of caching, for example, with intermediaries that don't understand this new range unit, but also we do have some data that there are some extremely bad implementations out there that assume that if range is present, it's always bytes. Um, and so there's risk on both sides. And I think what, for me personally, 
the end of that conver the, the state we left that conversation in was we need more data to decide which path is less risky. So, all right. So, at least based on our own just testing for the applications and the libraries we were using, trying to change the b semantics of byte itself is actually was very risky because we actually encountered libraries that just kind of flipped up. Mm -hmm. So that's why we are proposing that I think the safer option is mm -hmm. to actually go with the defining a new unit, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to understand if there's any objection to define the new unit. So granted that with a new unit, there might be some caches or some proxies that may just because they're expecting just bytes, right? Mm -hmm. They may just do something weird. At the very least, the worst case scenario should be that they should not cache it because they don't right. understand it. Exactly. If they do anything more than that, then they are really, really bad implementations. Right. right? So, so should we actually like try to even care about those really, or should we actually try to find out if they're really that bad? Mm. So I think what we're, uh, I'm, I guess, proposing is, is there any objection to kind of moving forward with uh, or proposing a new byte, a new unit? Mm -hmm. And we can come up with a name and everything else, but I, I was kind of left a little confused about what the recommendation was in terms of a new unit. Right. Um, I think. Well, does anyone in the room have any opinions or thoughts about that? No, but Roy has a comment that it's not really changing semantics; it's just breaking stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, it's certainly possible. <clears throat> I, I mean, we would look at, in, in terms of adopting a new draft, we'd look at everything you know that we'd look at uh, for the rest that we adopt, which is, is there implementary uh, ex interest in it? Uh, does it address a broad set of use cases for HTTP? You know, we, we generally try not to adopt things that are just for a specific application, but rather that are, are general facilities for the protocol. Um, and I think that, that certainly this probably is okay by that letter metric. I'm less certain right now whether there's implementer interest. Um, and, and of course, if we start a new range unit, there are potentially other things that might be interesting to do at the same time, uh, other modifications that people might want to make to the semantics. Julian. Um, two points. Um, if there are really many intermediaries or, or actually important pieces of code that do the wrong thing with an unknown range unit, I'd like to know. So mm -hmm. I, I'm totally in favor of having that experiment, um, which leads me to the question, in your use case, um, would you use that over HTTP or over HTTPS? Both. The, 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 so I forget who did it, but someone went and did the research on this. And the bugs that they found were in things like client libraries for media, for, for streaming video. Um, and so this isn't necessarily an intermediary problem. We can certainly go and look at Squid and Traffic Server and a few other open source implementations at least. But these were in, you know, open source and, and closed source media libraries consuming streaming video, uh, which is, as I understand it, your core use case. So, uh, so uh, if we, I mean, we haven't talked about that today, but we still plan in the midterm to actually open up the core specs and revise them for full standard. Mm -hmm. So the question is whether the um, change that Roy has uh, thrown in, whether that would be actually that we could do when we move to full standard. And uh, another thing that comes to mind is the um, shaky relationship between Byte ranges and other content encodings, and whether we would like to do something about that as well, if, if we start working on that. Like, like to clarify, um, you, you really can't do a byte range request in practice over something that has been dynamically yes. content encoded. Yes. You, you can, but you won't get what you what most people expect. I mean, people who understand the specs said that's what that's clear. It's clear that you get that, but it's not the intuitive answer. Yeah, that and that's come up from time to time. I just there's not yet been enough interest to pursue that. So just a final question. So. Uh, we were proposing, is it possible to 
have have a bytes or an additional range unit as a individual draft or a submission, or does it need to be a working group item? Um, that depends upon the registry policy, uh, and I imagine that it's going to be IETF review. Okay. That was the policy we chose for most things, and but we can find out in just a moment. Mm -hmm. IETF review, yeah. So um, because this working group exists, I think my intuition is there would be a substantial amount of pressure to do it here. Okay. And, um, and, and, and that's completely reasonable. I think we just need to have the discussion with implementers and make sure that it gets appropriate review and that you yeah, know, and there's I'm no objections. I'm perfectly okay with it. I just wanted to make sure that uh, if people are not interested, and we really need the unit, and I'm okay, we are okay to go Understood. through the motion. You're talking to the right people for now, yeah. So um, what we can do is, uh, let, let's start a discussion on the mailing list, and get pe people to spend a little time reviewing it, and see if, if we can come to some idea about whether we want to adopt it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay, anybody have anything else? Um, since we seem to have time, even though it seems to be shrinking, there was a topic that Sabor <coughs> raised on the, on the um, list a few uh, back in March about once we start having early data in TLS 1.3, what is it act? What's the interaction and binding into HTTP? Yeah. And we haven't really talked about that much recently that I saw, oh, but yeah. it seems like something we're going to potentially need to raise because this, mm -hmm. if TLS is saying, "Hey, there's a special API here." Mm -hmm. There's, I think, going to be need to be some clarification of when it's okay for HTTP clients to use that API. Yes. So, yeah. Go ahead, Martin Thompson. This is this is actually really really easy thing to answer. So, um, we had a bunch of discussion about this one, and um, Patrick made some interesting discoveries about how people replay requests in the real world, and it mm -hmm. turns out that you have to replay posts. Yes. The internet depends on the web depends on it, and um, if you don't, everything breaks. And there's some really funky examples that Patrick can go into that were just mind-bogglingly terrible. Hmm. But the net effect of that is you end up in a situation where if you send a post request and you get zero bytes of a response to that, you will automatically replay. That. You've got no evidence that the server has actually received that message. Um, and processed it, so you have to replay it. There's a lot of situations where you send a post request and the server kits, kills the connection and expects you to retry again. And that is exactly the situation that we're in with zero RTT. We're in a situation where we're sending a message and we don't know if the server's got it at the point that it arrives, it could be replayed, um, and we're in a situation where we won't get any response back in those situations because, well, it's being replayed by some attacker and and um, it's gone off into the ether. But again, the same net effect. If it's not idempotent, then it's not idempotent and, and you've just paid someone $100 twice rather than once. Um, all of those sorts of things are real, but the fact of the matter is the web has this vulnerability already if we didn't yes. realize it. Um, it's been there for a long time and it, we kind of depend on it. So um, the API that we ultimately settled on was you open the socket, you write to it. You no other signals. There's only one signal that you need, which is the server told you that your zero RTT data was not accepted. Uh, please replay it. And then you go off and obediently replay them, all of that stuff again. Hmm. So that's where we're at. I know it's going to make some security people open their veins, but um, <laughs> I don't see. I don't. So I mean, that's that's just one of the trials of being a security person. Right. You have to deal with that. And and I, as I'm sure you remember, I started researching this at the same time and found that intermediaries are doing much the same. You know, some intermediaries respect the HP specs somewhat, but none of, nobody does it perfectly. Yeah, uh, so Pat McManus, so to flush out that story, in uh, Firefox 46 through um, a change I didn't fully understand the implications of. I'm disabled uh, replay of post on a broken persistent connection um, most of the time. And I can say um, without equivocation that the web does not work if you do that. 
Um, I had dozens of blocking bugs, people wanting to release hot fix releases. Um, it was not a good day. Um, but I learned all kinds of curious ways in which the web does require uh, replay of post and everything else, um, some of which might amuse some of you. Um, there is a website out there that has a persistent connection timeout on the server side of 250 milliseconds, um, which has got to be about the worst possible number one could choose, which results in a collision of trying to use that socket almost every single time. And yet the bug report says, works fine in IE and Chrome, right? Always, right? And did in Firefox until, <coughs> until I updated this morning. Uh, um, have another website that, um, depending on which URI you request from the site, actually executes that under different permissions on the server side. And it doesn't know how to make that change on an existing persistent connection. So it just says, oh my god, I need to be somebody else, and closes the connection, assuming you will call it back. Um, what's really, really fun about that is when that happens, you, of course, just instead of making a new connection, you're like, well, I've got this other idle person connection. I'll use that one. And so you go like right through your pool. And so unless you are willing to replay at least seven times, you cannot successfully connect to the server. So um, I think it's Adam Langley that said, you know, if TLS doesn't repeat it, or if TCP doesn't repeat it, TLS will repeat it. If TLS doesn't repeat it, HTTP will repeat it. If HTTP doesn't repeat it, the damn user is going to hit reload and replay it themselves. So it's going to right. get replayed. Subo Nangar. Um, so to add to this point, I think there's one part of the component that's still missing, like uh, which is the. Uh, so basically, it comes down to like the application is the only one who knows whether or not this data is idempotent, and. Um, and we can provide from TLS, we can provide like various like defense and depth techniques to sort of like limit the replayability of the initial data. Uh, but um, so we need a mechanism for the application to tell the lowest layers like it. So the at the socket layer, it'll just be a write. But uh, there at the brow like if it's a mobile app or if it's a browser, there'll be something on top of it, which like basically schedules the requests which can be written out onto the socket and does it which is aware of like the application level item potency guarantees. So one of the proposals, hopefully we'll discuss this HP workshop or something like that, but uh, one of the is adding a header field, which is like this is retry safe. So for example, like even if you have a get request to the body, then like the application has no idea of to the body. It's possible, <laughs> just not defined. Yeah. But um, so, like, the application can tell you through the header, like, hey, I'm, I'm actually, like, safe. And you can replay, re retry me. And, and uh, we have use cases for this also not only on the client side, but also on the load balancer, for instance. So um, if, you're, if you have, like, a smaller data center or something like that, and you have, like, a bigger data center, so it actually, like, there, there was a Google paper about this, like, a while ago, where you could actually kind of improve your uh, latency by, uh, because one of the data centers will have, like, not enough capacity. So if you retry this other data center, you save the timeout that you didn't get the response back from the initial data center. So if you, you retry, if, and you can only do this if, like, the load balancer knows it's safe to retry. So you, what's that? Well. Mm. <laughs> Well, like put is also like that depends on your uh, application semantics as well. Yeah. So it's not really like our app, our application semantics not fit into like put, and also like really put is also in a in a multi distributed data center environment. Like you can't really guarantee like the idempotency of put as well. So <laughs> it, it, <laughs> so I mean it's like uh, from HTTP spec situation, it says it's item it's it's idempotent and it's cool. But uh, it, it, there's, there's some debate about that as well. But uh, so yeah, like application API and header is like a reasonable way to do it. I'm, I'm like open it up to like what people think. Okay. And given the kind of non, given the um, somewhat surprising nature of, of post not actually, or of the item potent nature not therefore of, of post, is that something that's worth the working group actually putting a document together to make this very clear that this problem's been punted up to the application layers and that they should not assume the post is the way it is right. and that they should handle appropriately? Well, you go ahead, Martin. So, so Martin Thompson, I, I was going to sort of point out that uh, 
some of the things that Subo was talking about are still relevant for people who are using HTTP outside of the web. And there's a lot of people who use HTTP for other things. And if you're not on the web or you have um, a much better behaved set of people um, that you're dealing with, I think the rules that we have in HTTP 1.1 should still be respected. And in general, when people are using TLS, they need to, to be aware of this replay property. The things that we're doing in browsers will be horrific from some perspectives, but we do all sorts of nasty things because we have to deal with the swamp that is the web. Um, I think that there's probably value in having a, having a document that says, you know, RFC 7230 says these things, or 7231 says these things about the item potency of these methods. Um, you should respect that. However, realize that when you deploy things like post on the web, <coughs> it had better damn well be item potent or you're going to get some surprises. And that's, I think that's useful guidance that we could give the community. Right. Yeah. And, and, and this is becoming more relevant because when we have TCP fast start, we have uh, you know, TCP, uh, TLS 1.3, we have quick coming down the pipe potentially. Uh, and all of these have impacts. So the only one of these that really matters, I think, is, is TLS 1.3. Um, but well, and all the clear text stuff out there that's yeah, you know, replay happy as you, as you like. But you know, well, quick will have the same problem, but hopefully that'll be quick factored on a TLS so one point three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sweet. It will be. Yeah. Okay. So both anger, like last four minutes. Hopefully, it takes too much of your time. Um, so another like question I have in this, like for example, like the item potency properties and stuff we specify. Um, would it? Would it be like, is the working group like okay with specifying that this is only applicable for like secure transports and you cannot use it for like insecure transports and stuff? So that would be the, so you couldn't use like uh, item potent data on like TC, on TCP fast open, so you'd need a secure transport to like uh, do TCP fast open plus TLS 1.3 or TLS 1.2, and then you would get all these properties. And like for similarly push and all these other like sure. new features are coming around. There are a surprising number of protocol facilities where that decision has been made. So I, I certainly think it's something we could talk about. Um, but yeah, I think we have to talk about the existing text in the HTTP RFCs to make sure that it's still correct. And, and as you were saying, talking about potentially new protocol facilities to help applications get the desired properties more easily. Um, and also to communicate that information down to the low, lower layers. So there's potentially a lot of work to happen here, but I, I, don't, I think we still have to do a lot of discussion. I think we'll hopefully see some new drafts about it soon. So I can't believe this, but I'm going to have to like you know close the lines because we're almost out of time. I, we just seem to burn a half an hour there without even trying. And anybody have anything else? No? No? <laughs> All right. So uh, the quick buff again is on Wednesday, uh, and we will meet again on Friday. Thanks a lot. Thank you.